uh, we the Palestinians believe that the Israelis are targeting the city center, uh, you know, old Hebron, and uh, that uh, there is a non-declared uh, plan to turn the old city and parts of South Hebron, uh, south of the city of Hebron, into a Jewish city and keep the Palestinians out. Much of the old city of Hebron has already been ridded of its Palestinian population as the result of a small community of right-wing Jewish settlers which has burrowed into its center. The goal of the settlers is to establish Jewish dominance in Hebron by linking the large settlement of Kiryat Arba to the old city, where the Tomb of Patriarchs is located. It is the tomb of Abraham, and uh, you know that Abraham is holy in all religions, and so it's a source of friction, it's an area of lots of friction. Uh, there was uh, uh, lots of fight uh, inside, around the place, and, well, and the worst was in 1994 when an Israeli settler came inside the, the Muslim side, sprayed with bullets, Palestinian worshippers kneeling to pray and killed the 29 people inside. Baruch Goldstein was an American-born Jewish settler living in the Kiryat Arba settlement. He was also a reserve member of the IDF, wearing his uniform and using his service weapon to carry out the massacre. The event further transformed the landscape of Hebron and accelerated the ethnic cleansing of the old city. They built this new security structure which is called the system of separation. Uh, it's pretty pretty out there, <laughs> pretty straightforward. And the idea is that in, in where there are Israelis living, there will be no friction or little to no friction between Israelis and Palestinians. Now how do you do that in an area where they're literally next door neighbors? You push the Palestinians back. The, the mosque area is kind of a military zone. Uh, so uh, when we get there, we will see checkpoints with metal detector gates. And of course, all the entrances have these restrictions of movement. Uh, but of course, on the Muslim side, it is uh, much worse than, than it is in the Jewish side. There's a, a magician world here that is called security. On the excuse of security, the Israeli authorities can prevent the Palestinians of, from any of their basic rights. Hebron as a whole has a Palestinian population of roughly 160,000, with about 20,000 living in the old city. Also living in Hebron are the 600 settlers protected by a battalion of 500 soldiers, plus Israeli police and Israeli border police. Israelis, including security forces, therefore make up much less than 1% of Hebron's population. Yet this small number has had a disastrous effect. What we focus on in breaking the silence is that there have been, there's been an unbelievable like, demographic shift since 1994 in the city. Most, even more since 2000, but it started in 1994. And if there were 30 to 35,000 Palestinians living in H2 in 1994 and 1997, today they're probably around 20,000. So we're talking about it in some areas like a 40% population decrease. 50% of the roads in H2, Palestinians aren't allowed to drive on. So all the roads that you're seeing here now, even though everybody who lives here, almost everybody who lives here are Palestinians, they're not like this shop, for example, he's not allowed to bring his car to his shop or to his house. And the idea is less cars, less friction, less friction, less people. The Shahada Street, it's the street that the settlers live in six different enclaves. The only traffic allowed to this area is Israeli traffic. It's either Israeli settlers or Israeli security. Palestinians are not allowed to drive at all. Now all of this, you, you have to use your imagination because this, this is all a market. All of these doors uh, like are storefronts. It's, people don't live here. I mean, people live in these doors, not in, not in these big ones. So you're walking now through like, the main market of like, the biggest city, one of the biggest cities in the territories. What's blocked here out behind that used to be the main mean market. And this is, this is the main market road of, uh, of the city, of basically of all, of all of Hebron. This might seem odd to you, but this place is like a tourist attraction for some, like, for like school kids and that kind of thing. So these are Israeli school kids who are just here on a trip to be at the city of our forefathers. And families live in this street that they are not supposed to have any visitors. For me as a Palestinian, I'm not supposed to pass these two concrete blocks at the corner. In Hebron H2, the Israeli controlled part of the city, there are 98 different kind of restriction of movement. That includes checkpoints like this, entrances that are totally closed by concrete blocks, by concrete barrels, 
by metal gates, uh, rooftop monitoring towers, etc. 98 in a very small area. Now, put it in context, these three families have not been allowed outside the front door of their house for the past almost 10 years, right, since, uh, since the beginning of Second Intifada. And usually when we talk about being, you know, closed inside, we think of sort of the dignity aspect, about how terrible it is that you're seeing another people walk on your street and you can't go out. But it's actually much more basic than that. First of all, we're talking about, I mean, as you can see, we're not only talking about like young adults there. I mean, there are kids living here, there are elderly people living here. But also in terms of like grocery shopping, uh, you know, just sort of basic goods. That man, but only entrance to his house is uh, through climbing a rope going into the roof. Uh, as you see, like to the left here, there is an entrance actually. The door you see in the wall there is, has been put by the military. It's not done by the Palestinians. It is closing the exit, the, the alley that leads to his house. And so to get to his house, he have to climb through uh, that uh, wall. In the past, he used to go in through the window, but then the Israeli security welded the window with these uh, metal uh, bars, metal pieces, and now his only option is to climb to the roof with a rope and going in from the roof entrance. Jews were living here much before Zionism. Uh, just like you had Jews living in Jerusalem, you had Jews living in you know, Tzfat, Tiberias. Uh, probably the most important event uh, in the 20th century in Hebron, which is in 1929, there was a massacre towards Jews in Hebron. 67 Jews were brutally murdered. The event is terrible in its own right, and it, and it needs to be you know, factored in, because the settlers, their terminology is n not that they're uh, settling, but that they're resettling. So it's not only the biblical resettling, but it's also the 1929 resettling. Well, yeah, it explains also the revenge graffiti and it also explains the sign. So obviously, look, obviously a lot of this is rhetorical and political and not factual because they're not the actual descendants of this 1929 community and they're, they're coming from a very different ideology and it's obviously in the context of a different nationalist picture, but 1929 is very much present in the, uh, in the background here. It's my ancient family house where my father was born. Uh, there were relatives of mine who continued living there till July 2002 when Israeli settlers broke into the house and kicked them out. The good thing is that the Israeli security came and evacuated the settlers. The bad thing is that they did not allow my relatives back. We went to the Israeli Supreme Court that gave a ruling in late 2005 that we should be allowed back within 45 days. Until today it seems that the 45 days are not finished yet and the house is still closed. 512 Palestinian stores are closed by direct Israeli military orders. They are not allowed to open at all. And in addition to this, we have nearly another 1,200 Palestinian stores that are closed indirectly as a, fact, as a result of the consequences of the presence of the settlers and the military occupation in the area. That gives an indirect message to the store owners, to the people who come do shopping here, to the people who live here, that says don't ever come back to this area. This, this fence we have here to protect the Palestinians walking, by, uh, walking through the market as Israeli settlers who live above uh, they threw uh, objects at Palestinians uh, who walk here. Uh, from time to time they throw rocks, sometimes big rocks, uh, metal bars, different kind of uh, dangerous objects. You see a military tower here and another military tower there. And I think, you know, for these soldiers at these towers, it's very easy for them to monitor, you know, people throwing things from there. Now, because of this screen, as you see, can protect us from the heavy objects, the, the, concrete, uh, and the, yeah, the concrete and the bricks, you see lots of empty plastic bags. They fill them with laundry water, urine, sewage water, and they throw them at the screen. And look, somebody is throwing your soil now. You've seen it by yourself now. These are settlers kids walking out now. I prefer that we hide behind this shelf of the 
Now, what's interesting about this military base is that you also have six settler families who live inside the base, which is contrary to every version even of Israeli law. What I like about the settlers in Hebron is that they're very upfront about what they believe. I mean, nobody's saying here, you know, we're here so there won't be rockets on Tel Aviv. Everybody's saying we're here because Abraham purchased it 4,000 years ago, and you know, either we're you believe it or you don't. So, yeah, and it's all it's all about like a different value system, and it's all about religion, and that's fair. At least everything's up front. And nobody's bullshitting you. Uh, this is the yeshiva, this is the religious school, and it is built over an old Palestinian school that was confiscated. On the, this side of it, you see there is a sign in Hebrew, and uh, that says Kiryat Arba is Hebron. And uh, Kiryat Arba is the biblical name of Hebron, and that reflects their ambition uh, of turning Hebron into a Jewish city. So 500 soldiers let's say, per like 600 settlers sounds like a high ratio. But in the military perspective, it's 500 soldiers per, whatever, 35,000 Palestinians. And then the idea is just keeping order in the city. And, and the, main, the, the, the main system around that is, make, is something we call in the army like making your presence felt. Like the idea is that all Palestinians will feel your presence at all times. So that's done in a lot of different ways, and some are more subtle than others. But the idea is that just that they'll know you're there. I was an officer in officer training academy. That was my last uh, position in the military. And uh, it was like the height of the second intifada. So instead of practicing urban warfare in some base in the south, we went to practice here. So we basically do, my cadets would have an assignment every, like a military assignment every night. And I would be uh, like the soldier in the unit, but also like monitoring the cadets. So we, did, uh, so we did a house arrest here. I mean, we did patrols, everything these people are doing. Pictures, pictures. Hey, tell them the pictures, hey. Give, 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 we always try to explain to the groups what's unique about here is that Israelis can come and see it. I mean, there are a lot of places in the territories which work pretty much on the same way. There's just no way to know. And this is one of those places where Israelis and internationals can actually come and look at what's happening. We actually grew up here in Israel, learning that, you know, even though history has proven that every military that occupied civilians became corrupt and took down civil society with it, we all grew up on believing that we're different. You know, we can actually do it with silk gloves, you know, we can do it nice, neat and clean. And, and that's, you know, we all went there believing that. The vast majority of the behavior that we talk that you find in testimonies that Breaking the Science publishes is mainly to do with the nature of the reality of occupation. It has nothing to do with the military. The military cannot change it. The military cannot make me a nice occupier. Now look, obviously if you're already standing at a checkpoint, you can be like more sadistic and less sadistic. And right. I, if you're already there, so like, I'd, like I'd appreciate you, like if, if you could be nice. But you know, the military's saying that, you know, the, the, everybody's saying that. We're, we just think that's not very serious. Because mm -hmm. a checkpoint is a checkpoint no matter how you, you know, no matter how you behave there. Mm -hmm. It's not about behaving well in the system, it's about the system. So it's, it's about occupation. Like I, I was beating myself up for years and I'm still beating myself up now that you know I could have here I could have done differently and here I could have done differently and there I could have done differently. Now that's bullshit. You know I've analyzed every situation, every type of that situation that I was in in the military. Believe me, like time and time again and, and part of me still says like oh, if I could have just, I could have just been better the situation w wouldn't occur. And that's a place where I think society would feel much more comfortable in, and, and the army would feel much more comfortable as is people just beating themselves up uh, about them not behaving properly and not understanding it's about a systematic problem. And it's about a, it's a, it's a, it's about a, it's about a problematic system. I want to go in Palestine without any checkpoints. I want to go without wars. I want to hold this idea, you know? Sometimes people, can, you, you don't understand this, and it's very simple. Since I am 16 years old, I never left this at home. This has been checked every day. 
Every day I have to show it to the soldiers. Every day I have to prove who I am. What kind of life is this? The Israeli occupation is very much a colonial project, seeking to transplant large numbers of Jews onto Palestinian land at the expense of the Palestinian population, as we have already seen. This is both militarily supported and government sanctioned. The settlers and the settlement movement is very connected to the government. The government stating that some settlements are illegal or legal is totally a lie. They know about all of them, they support them, they get water, they get electricity when they want to. They're working with us with, with two uh, hands. By the first hand, they're giving a permission for more and more settlements. By the second hand, they demolished the, the Palestinian houses in Jerusalem and in the West Bank. Isa is a Palestinian activist from the West Bank village of Hares, now in the shadow of the mega-settlement Ariel, named after former Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. Isa was paralyzed by an Israeli bullet in 2001. His house and others are now termed illegal by Israeli authorities, meaning they could face demolition. All these houses you are seeing here, it have been, been built without permission from Israeli authorities. And when we uh, request a permission, it's not allowed for us. So by a circle, it's not allowed for us to continue our life. The community is growing, but we still live, live in the same uh, one kilometer square. Mm -hmm. So the only way here to build it on top of the houses, each floor, it's me a new generation. Like the father and the mother, they live in the first floor, their sons, if they marry, they build on the top. The sons of the sons, if they want to marry, they build on the top. It's like this. So this is the only way to expand here. And sometimes if you look to the top of the houses, you can find a lot of houses, it's not finished yet. Sometimes to build the house inside the camp, you need 10 years or 12 years. Re really, we, we face this problem with the children, right? Uh, like every, every week they saw the occupation, when the army they come in the camp and they, uh, they shoot the people and they throw some gas. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to children to understand that or, and it's really effect to their uh, life. When they grow up, they, they, they grow up with the violence. They didn't live in, like every children in the world. They live in the, in the street, they play in the street, so they, they, grow, they grow up in the street. They should lead the, another generation, but if they if they uh, grow with all this bad thing, they will affect to another gen generation and another and another. So it will be like, it will be bad to us. It's hard. Like in the morning time, we had the Palestinian police in the streets, and after midnight, the Israelis they can come and they can do whatever they want. So from 2002, they come. They, I can say daily, like they come to this place. They arrest people. Sometimes they bomb houses. Sometimes you know they like last time. It was two days ago. They come in the middle of the camp and they put very loud music. In the, mid, in the mid, like around four o'clock in the morning, you know. So till midnight, it's under the Palestinian control. After midnight, it's under the Israeli control. So they can come do whatever they want. One afternoon, Dam went to the Salfit region of the West Bank with some Israelis who were wanting to visit their Palestinian friends. The group included one young man who had never before been to the occupied territories. After a 40 minute drive from Tel Aviv, we were there and soon detained by the military. They told us that we're not allowed to be here. They got orders that they have to kick us out of here. What, what were the reasons they gave why we couldn't be here? That it's dangerous, and that there was a big sign saying that we are not allowed and we passed it, now we have to go back. I just came out here today for the first time because as you guys, I wanted to see it in my eyes. I live in Tel Aviv, not far away from here. Always hear about it and uh, argue with my friends all the time, but I was never here. I think it's very, very important for us to see it. That's the main problem in Israel is that nobody wants to hear about it, nobody wants to see it, and therefore it does not exist for most Israelis. I think they just don't want to know. 
it's much easier to accept it if you don't know what is really happening. And we've been seeing this as a policy that's growing stronger and stronger yeah. over the past 20 years. It wasn't like this as much before. Um, but now we not only have separate law systems, we have like separate roads and, and the fence and the army create a situation for the reality where Israelis and Palestinians don't meet at all. Occupation isn't something happening on a different content, a con continent for us. It's something which is happening like five minutes away from our house. And it's something which is very, it's, it's something which, it's not, it's not like you go over there and you do that and then you come back here. It's something which is very, very connected. You know, the people who are, you know, you, you hear noise in the background of somebody building, like, uh, it's a synagogue, actually, <laughs> on the other side of the street. That, the other, like, Palestinians from, you know, from Bethlehem or from whatever who are, who are being brought here for cheaper labor. Horrible things are happening 30 minutes from here, eastwards. And, and people don't want to see it because it, what, what does it mean about them? The city of Jerusalem is divided between the Palestinian East and the Israeli West. Following the 1967 war, the Armistice Line, or the Green Line, was drawn to establish a border between the Israeli state and the occupied West Bank. This line annexed East Jerusalem, the site of several holy sites for both Jews and Muslims, including the Wailing Wall and Al-Aqsa Mosque, among many others. Sensitive to demographics, the population of Jews versus Palestinians, and the desire to maintain a Jewish state, Israel was very careful as to how it would incorporate this holiest of cities into its territory. The people who, who drew this line were thinking, okay, how can we get maximum territory into, into Israel annexed without actually um, having all the people on it? So the way that they drew the border is really interesting because it stops short of all the main Palestinian cities, right, which are less favorable to us land versus people-wise, because this whole area was not built up. This whole area that you see here was not nearly as built up at the time in the 60s and early 70s. Um, this was mostly like agricultural land, so like small villages. And so it was a good idea to annex this territory because it had a lot of land, no people. And you can see that the, the line stops just north of Bethlehem, just south of Ramallah, just west of Azariya. Like it's basically all the big cities, we don't want the people there because then, you know, they're just messing up our demographic. We're just going to stop there. And that's pretty much how the municipal uh, border was drawn. The main struggle that Israel is constantly fighting is we want more land, but we don't want the people living on it, right? The non-Jews. We're trying, we, you know, in order to be a democracy, we have to maintain a Jewish majority of citizens, otherwise we're not a democracy. We're a minority of Jews ruling over a majority of non-Jews. We can't have that happen because then we're not going to be called a democracy anymore. The Jerusalem government has actually made an official policy to maintain the population of the municipality at 30% Palestinian and 70% Jewish. But the Palestinian population is already at 35% and rapidly growing. In response, the Israeli authorities have targeted Palestinian housing. With an expanding population in East Jerusalem, the Palestinian community needs to build. For the municipality virtually never grants building permits to Palestinians, leading to massive so-called illegal construction. The Jerusalem government uses this as a pretext to demolish Palestinian homes. The way it works is they come out, they surround a house, right? So there's 50, 60 soldiers and border police. They call them with a megaphone, come out, we're going to demolish your home. Now, sometimes they give them three or four hours, which is very generous, to remove all of their belongings or all of their important belongings. Sometimes they give them 15 minutes. If they don't want to go out, they tear gas them out. And in addition, it's ironic, they're often going to be billed for the demolition itself. The municipality bills them and says, we employed a bulldozer, we employed border police, we employed all these things to demolish your home, now pay us. 20,000 houses at least in East Jerusalem have house demolition orders. Again, it's using the legal court system. Seeming, it seems like a logical step, right? You built illegally, you violated the law, you have to be punished in a seemingly democratic country. Except that again, you know, they have, they're, they're forced into the situation, this catch-22 situation, where you know, they have to build illegally. This is a form of ethnic cleansing. Not giving them building permits, not creating zoning plans for them, that's a very effective way that seems legal and seems legitimate, um, sort of on a, on a surface level, to, to basically make them want to leave. Because if you can't build more, uh, you can't expand your house, and you're having more children, how are you going to live? In 
In addition to the regular house demolitions that plagued the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Silwan, right-wing Jewish settlers have now evicted and taken over 20 Palestinian homes. And on top of this, the Israeli-controlled municipality has approved the expansion of a national park, the City of David, where the biblical King David is believed to have once had a park beside his palace, but is currently a long-established Palestinian neighborhood. In the creation of this park, the plan is to demolish a further 88 Palestinian homes. <laughs> Another East Jerusalem neighborhood being threatened is that of Sheikh Jarrah. International attention is focused on this area as settlers have manipulated the Israeli court system to evict Palestinian families and take over their houses. What we're seeing here um, is a discriminatory policy where basically pre-48 ownership rights are applying to Jews only and settlers are claiming their the homes here based, based on the fact that at 448 they belong to Jews.